Hello everybody and welcome to His Toyery, a show where I talk about the history of modern toys. Today's episode focuses on something a little unique, something I haven't really seen much discussion about within my toy running circles. You know when a toy comes out that's like super popular and everybody has one and wants one, and then all of a sudden the girl's version comes out, it's a little different, a little stranger, and when you look at it it's just kind of the original toy with a new coat of paint and eyelashes. Or if, you know, a boy's version comes out, it's the same thing, but all of a sudden has a lot more to do with gross bodily functions than previously did. Seems like they're just kind of riding the gendered coattails. I've never seen this phenomenon described or really well documented before, so I'll try to explain it as best I can without actually having a proper phrase to do the description. This first kind of got brought to mind when I was out searching for some Shopkins the other day. What caught my attention slightly more were some grocery gang packs. Upon closer inspection, I discovered they were both manufactured by the same company, Moose. A little bit of research showed that the Shopkins were released well before the Grocery Gang. Shopkins were on wave three or four when Grocery Gang was even released. I have a few of those that I'll be unboxing a little bit later on, but for now, let's get through the heavy stuff. Some of the first examples I can find aren't direct counterparts. Barbie was released by Mattel in 1959 to much avail, and Hasbro followed suit with G.I. Joe three years later, a direct result of Barbie's success. The first iteration of Creepy Crawlers, then known as the Thing Maker, contained sets that read not only insects, but flowers and dolls. These toys were distinct, but still noticeably gendered. In fact, though G.I. Joe was released in the same scale as Barbie, they were distinctly referred to as action figures, despite them being basically just dolls. The 80s brought with it a whole new spread of gendered entertainment properties, and as a result, toys to go along with it, or so it seemed. Companies like American Greetings countered their own saccharine sweet Care Bears with a rough and grotesque buddy known as My Pet Monster. Mattel partnered their loincloth hero He-Man with his sister, She-Ra. The Cabbage Patch Kids hurled into the trash and found the Garbage Pail Kids, a direct reaction by a different trademark holder. My buddy had his kid sister. and kid sister, eat sold separately from Play School. This was only the beginning. The Toy Shell TV series trend continued well into the 90s, though most weren't explicitly gendered. In fact, the fad toys of the era, you know, Big Pogs, Tickle Me Elmo, and Pokemon, stuff like that, tended to be properties that had a gender neutral appeal. You didn't need to be a boy to like Pokemon, and you didn't need to be a girl to play Pogs. However, through properties like Bluebird and Mattel's Polly Pocket and Mighty Max, and Kenner Hasbro's Easy Bake Oven and Queasy Bake Cookerator, the trend persisted. Mighty Max, Mighty Max! It's Mighty Max! Welcome to Skull Dungeon. Wow! Hi, I'm Polly Pocket. Let's have fun in my playhouse together. Additionally, the aforementioned Think Maker came back with a vengeance called now by its new name, the Magic Maker, under the header of Creepy Crawlers. Check out the difference between this vintage 60s commercial. Creepy Crawlers, Creepy Crawlers, Creepy Crawlers. Now, you can make all kinds of lovely things like these with Mattel's wonderful Think Maker. It makes creepy crawlers. Spiders, lizards, snakes, dragonflies, make them yourself with this nice plastic goop. And the new rad 90s version. to treasures and trinkets, of course, because there's no way girls could like bugs. For reverse of this, remember trolls? Of course, they were ubiquitous in the 90s and have recently made a resurgence with the new movie. You know, Justin Timberlake's involved, come on. Everyone loved them, everyone had them, but somewhere along the line it was decided that, nah, trolls are for girls, we've gotta make a boy version. 
and lo, the battle trolls were released. That's when all the cute little trolls thought it was safe to come out and play! but they weren't as explicitly not for girls as that Battle Trolls commercial was. These two were partnered with Saturday Morning Cartoons. We've seen that phenomenon rear its ugly head again recently, specifically when Hasbro launched its hub network and found one show in particular that appealed to a demographic it never expected. But we'll save that discussion for another video. What I do want to discuss in its stead is probably the most egregious of these sins, taking an existing property that was fairly gender neutral and pinkwashing it. The two biggest examples I can think of are probably with Nerf and Lego. Nerf has been around in various iterations since the late 1960s, but in the early 90s toughened up its logo to appear more manly. Its Rebel offshoot wasn't introduced until 2013, and while the line routinely includes new and innovative weapons, including its first real bow and arrow in decades, it garnered a lot of well-deserved criticism for its color scheme and marketing. Similarly, LEGO traditionally marketed itself very neutrally. You may be familiar with this 80s LEGO ad, where a young girl in braids holds up her new creation proudly, and the caption reads, What it is, is beautiful. As LEGO began to produce more and more licensed properties, however, they shifted marketing focus to boys. Because of that, in 2012, LEGO released its Friends line, explicitly feminine in nature. His biggest criticism came from the fact that the sets were significantly less complex than other comparable LEGO lines, as well as featuring minifigs that were very different from the traditional ones. LEGO's next set targeted towards young girls, the elves, seems to have switched back to a more traditional building style, albeit still with the modified minifigs. Which brings us to the present day. Moose hit fairly big recently with the introduction of Shopkins in 2014. However, the story doesn't really start there. It starts surprisingly in 2011, when Moose introduced the Trash Pack. Trash Pack figurines were similar to Shopkins, but, well, gross. <coughs> Though Trash Pack did fairly well in its native Australia and the UK, it didn't seem to crack the US market as well as Moose would have liked. The Trash Pack was retired after seven series in 2014, shortly after the debut of Moose's newest creation, Shopkins. Shopkins, Shopkins! Welcome to the Shopville Grocery Store, home of super cute Shopkins galore! Frozen, bakery, fruit, and veg, there are aisles of Shopkins to collect! Shopkins, as you may know, took over the world, or at least the U.S. market. Though their pink packaging and plungers with eyelashes may have attempted to sell otherwise, Shopkins seemed to have a pretty universal appeal, and kids of all genders collected them pretty equally. Using household items intended for all members of the family kind of helped its appeal. Moose, however, wanted to push Shopkins in a pretty female direction, especially with the introduction of their Shopkins dolls, Shoppies, in 2015. To make up for their lack of a male-targeted product, Moose rebooted the trash pack as the Grocery Gang in 2016. It's the Grocery Gang! Shopping? It's gone right! The Gross Gang that live in a store! Check packets are where they hide! Open up, what will, will you find? Number one, fifty, you can't collect! They're similar to Shopkins in the fact that they're mostly grocery-based items, but they're... You know, gross. In part two of this episode, I'll be unboxing some Shopkins and Grocery Gang packs. Until then, wonder with me why so many toys rely so heavily on gendering when it's entirely unnecessary. Thanks for watching.